Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is April 22nd, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone enjoyed their long Easter weekend. Glad to have you back with me today. So what took place in the markets on this slow Monday? Well, the S&P was up three points. The Dow closed down 48 and a half. The Nasdaq gained 17 points. And the Russell 2000, the small cap index, closed down five, almost six points for the day. Meanwhile, where was the excitement? Well, it was in the commodities market, particularly that of the oil market, that black gold. Oil is now sitting at $65.66 a barrel. That was a gain of 2.5 percentage points. Gold now sits at $1,277 an ounce. Silver, meanwhile, still remains under $15 at $14.98. The 10-year Treasury was up 1% for the day and now sits at 2.59%. And the VIX gained two and three quarters of a percentage point today and now sits at $12.42. So what's all the noise with the oil market? Well, if you remember, one of candidate Trump's campaign promises was to Get out of the Iran nuclear deal. Remember, that was the worst deal ever. Well, it was one of them. He has, I mean, if it wasn't a deal he made, it's, it's all the worst. I don't know if that was the worst or NAFTA or whatever. There's a ton of bad deals. Iran was definitely one of the worst, according to candidate Trump. And he fulfilled that promise. He said, uh, you know, we're out. We're, we're not going to be a part of it. And we, we left it. We left it. However, there were a lot of other countries around the world that signed off on that deal and were a part of that deal. So they weren't too happy that the United States was backing out of it. Okay, that's fine. I mean, we're, we're not supposed to really care who likes this, that, and the other. That, that's not the game we're supposed to play here. We're supposed to look out for our best interests, just like the chancellor of Germany is supposed to look out for their best interests, just like the prime minister of the UK is to look out for their best interests, etc., etc. According to the president, the Iran deal was a bad deal, and it was not in the best interests of the United States. We had an election. He became president. That was one of his themes. That was one of his talking points. So he undid it. That's where we are. Now, because there were other countries involved in making your way through the process, maybe trying to get some other deal struck, obviously there's nothing that has been done in the meantime. We still can't even get some trade deals accomplished. So this being done with a nuclear power country or one that's trying to acquire nuclear weapons in the Middle East, you know, let's not cross our fingers, hold your breath, you're going to pass out type deal, okay? We can't get a trade deal with the EU. You really think you're going to get another deal with the Iranians right now in the midst of all the other stuff that's going on? Highly unlikely, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But again, in the meantime, there were some waivers that the United States granted several other countries, one of them being China, that said, okay, look, you want to import Iranian oil? Be our guest. Be our guest until this year. Deadline's coming up. Once that deadline hits, I mean, these countries were obviously hoping for another waiver, for an extension on the waiver, but at least right now, the president and the secretary of state, Mike, Mo- Mike Pompeo, are playing hardball. They're playing tough guy. They're playing the bad cop. And they're saying, no, these, you had the waiver. You knew that it was going to expire. You knew there was a deadline. You had time to prepare to basically you know, acquire oil from where you have to, but it's not going to be Iran because we're done. You had your waiver process. You had your deadline. It's it. That's it. So now you got to go find it somewhere else. So now you're talking a big geopolitical story. You're also talking an economic story. And this is what you're seeing in the markets right now. You have, again, oil. This is, this is uh, WTI here, the $65.66 a barrel. Well, what happens if we look at the European counterpart with Brent? Well, that's over $74 a barrel. You have to remember, folks, oil took a big hit last year. And a lot of people were obviously happy with that in regards to lower gasoline prices at the pump. And the president was happy because he he looked like he was the strong man and he strong-armed OPEC and Saudi Arabia and said, you know, keep those those pumps pumping, keep them going. We need that oil. We need it. Keep it going. Lower oil prices, lower gas. We need it. Come on. Well, now there's a reversal. 
You have OPEC, you got Russia, they're doing production cuts. Oil prices have rebounded. I mean, very strongly. We were in the 40s last year. Now we're in the 60s, going to the 70s. Brent is in the 70s. I mean, that is one hell of a rise. One huge comeback in a very short period of time, just like the stock market. But this is this is really pronounced. Does it have legs? How long can it last? Well, right now, you've just thrown a geopolitical hand grenade, if you will, into the mix. I mean, is it a dud or will it detonate? I mean, so far, we're seeing the response that was predictable. There's an increase in oil. What will the Iranians do? Will they, you know, will they issue empty threats or will they actually try to do something over there in the Strait of Hormuz where a lot of the world's oil it, it travels? I mean, that's where it goes through. I mean, are they going to do something with their navy? Because this, is, this could potentially be a game changer, depending on if it escalates, not only in rhetoric, but in action. I mean, you could have a huge problem here overnight. That's what this could turn into, because it's not just Iran now that you have this production now not hitting the market. You also have the issues in Libya, and you have the ongoing issues in Venezuela. So again, when you're analyzing oil just from a really high level of looking at it, you have supply, you have demand. You have the price of the dollar, how the dollar is trading, if it's strong, if it's weak, what's going on. And then you also have geopolitical factors, and that's what affects the price of oil. Now, there's obviously some more to it, but if you're just looking for conversational purposes and if you're just looking for a, a general guideline as to where it is and where it's likely going, those are the four things you look at. Supply, demand, the strength of the dollar, and geopolitical risk. Well, we know, at least according to our analysis, what I'm saying here on the Capitol News, is the demand picture is not as strong as what the president and the White House claim it to be. Now, that's in tune and harmony with other people out there, hedge funds, we talk about that, whether that's the IMF, the World Bank, some of those projections that have been getting lower and lower, some projections from the European Central Bank saying that, well, you know what, we thought maybe we were bottoming out, maybe we were out of the woods or close to it now, not so much. So the demand picture is not that strong. The supply picture, I mean, the United States is cranking it out like it's going out of style. That's going. But now you have production cuts in OPEC, in Russia. Now you have Iranian oil that's not going to be hitting the market. You have the issues in Venezuela, the ongoing issues in Libya. So now you got a supply problem. You also got a demand problem, right? Now the dollar, it really depends what day it is because that thing's gyrating back and forth right now too. Again, a weaker dollar generally corresponds to higher oil prices, and that makes sense because oil is traded in dollars. And if you have a weaker dollar, it takes more dollars to buy the same barrel of oil. So that makes sense, right? Lastly is geopolitical. Well, now you just, again, you threw a hand grenade into the mix here with Iran. What are they going to do? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Now, the president says, well, you know, I've been on the phone with, you know, Saudi Arabia and yada, yada, yada. You know, we're going we're gonna to take care of it. Nah, I don't, I don't know. I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. Maybe I'm a little skeptical that oil prices will be going down anytime soon with this type of tension that's in the air. Because you have to remember, too, folks, China was one of these countries that uh, was issued a waiver. So was India. I mean, you're talking two billion people. They need commodities, all right? So you're also in the midst of a trade negotiation with the Chinese. So how is this going to play? Were they informed that this was going to be taking place? Was this out of right field, left field? They never saw this coming? Because I don't think they're taking too kindly to it. I mean, they got a billion plus people. They need energy. They're going to get it from where they need it, from where they want it. So is that going to throw a curveball in the talks? I mean, the talks aren't going that well anyway. I mean, come on. We, we've had the conversation. We know that 2025 is how long the Chinese are going to have to... Uh, to get into compliance. At least that's what we know up to now. Could that change? Sure. Sure it could. But at least from what we know now, it's not going to be the best deal ever. But nevertheless, it could serve as a positive catalyst, at least in the short term, for the stock markets, which is just looking for any type of positive news to go higher. But as we see here, even though we're in the midst of earnings season, there really hasn't been any 
big moves to the upside. Now, you saw a couple big moves in the Dow, but the Dow is only 30 stocks. So the Dow isn't the best measure, especially when you have to take into consideration the companies that comprise the Dow and some of the recent news that's coming out. Remember, the whole story with Boeing, and Boeing has a nice weighting when it comes to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So all of this back and forth news regarding Boeing and do the, 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 does the plane have a problem? Yes, it's going to be fixed. Yes, blah, blah, blah. Anything that looks positive will drive it higher. Anything that looks bad will drive it lower, obviously. But they're looking for these positive shocks and for these positive headlines to come out. And if those happen, and they have been coming out, if not day by day, every other day, every few days, and it sort of acts as a positive catalyst for the Dow. Then again, you had the news come out of Disney with their streaming service. The markets welcomed that with open arms, and that moved the market up. J.P. Morgan, record profits, strong revenue, right? I mean, everything's fine and dandy. Of course it isn't, but, you know, that's what they want to say. Move the market up. So you have some strong days in the Dow. What you really have to look at is the S&P. That's a broader basket, right? That's the 500 largest companies. That's who you want to have a better look at if you're going to analyze these markets. Look more at the S&P as opposed to the Dow. But nevertheless, you focus on both. And that's why we're seeing, you know, a gain of three points today on the S&P and not much movement in any of the markets. We're, we're in a holding pattern. The markets are like, all right, we're exhausted here. We have this V-shaped recovery in the stock market, which is a rarity, by the way. How much longer can it go? What's the catalyst to move it forward, to move it a lot higher? How much higher? We've had the discussion last week in regards to Ray Dalio and his hedge fund, the largest hedge fund in the world, Bridgewater Associates, coming out with a report saying, look, we're into, we, we think that uh, U.S. corporations have peaked. Profit margins have peaked. It, it, it's to the downside now. And this could have a significant decline in equities, as much as 40%, which is what we've been predicting here at the Capital News for a long time. I told you, at the minimum, in my opinion, we're going back to 2016 levels at a minimum. I, there's no reason why it won't go down further to really get to true value, to, to real fair market value. But we have, you know, the president tweeting. We have central banks coming in to save the day, to print more money when it's needed. And it's always needed because the frat boys throwing their party on Wall Street don't want the party to end. And we've looked at the graphs. We've had that discussion of the monetary base against the stock market. It's been bought and paid for. It's been bought for by the Federal Reserve. It's been paid for by you. You're living paycheck to paycheck, but you're priming the pump here. This is what you're paying for, it, higher prices. Higher prices, this is what you get. You want to bail out the banks for 10 years? Is that what you thought was going to happen? You thought TARP was just going to be a $700 billion injection, capital injection, a decade ago, and maybe the Federal Reserve would do some help. Well, they've been helping them for a decade. They threw a hissy fit last quarter, 2018. Well, well we made a mistake. Policy 180, back to prime and the pump. Maybe we'll lower interest rates. Can't do it. I mean... This is the world we live in. This is why it's so shaky. So you have the likes of Ray Dalio and company coming out and saying, look, we're thinking U.S. corporate profit margins have peaked because a lot of the environment and a lot of the things that are taking place, not so conducive to companies anymore. You got the Trump tax cuts. The money printing is there. I mean, how much more can it go? That's the question. Diminishing marginal returns has to kick in at some point. You also have the other argument from Larry Fink. And this is more, this isn't so much I don't believe. Again, Larry Fink is the, the CEO of BlackRock, a major uh, investment uh, company, sort of like a Vanguard. Man, they manage uh, $6.5 trillion in assets under management. So a titan in, in the investment world. Uh, I, I don't think this is something that he is advocating for and saying that it is going to happen, but it's a possibility. And I agree very much with him that it is a possibility that there could be a melt up, a melt up in the stock market, not a meltdown. And that's just basically saying there's a lot of cash that remains on the sidelines because a lot of people were still worried from the fourth quarter of 2018. A lot of people have missed out on this recovery. And so there could be a fear of missing out effect that comes into play. There could be some sort of other positive news that does come to light that the market rallies on. And people say, okay, well, maybe it's time to get in. Well, I think that's going to be a sucker's rally, but that would be par for the course. I mean, if it was easy to make money in the stock market, everybody would do it, right? So be very careful. But it's very possible that this market does make 
new record highs. It can happen. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I think net-net, this is a market that will correct to fair market value, and I think at the least it's going to go back to 2016 levels. Again, that is in agreement with Ray Dalio and company, or he's in agreement with me because I've been saying this a lot longer than he's had that report out. Now, what they've been thinking internally, we don't know. That's their business, obviously. But it's nice to feel somewhat vindicated that, uh, you know, a man doing this, by, I'm a one-man show here, you know, that just looks at some of this data, and now I have the world's largest hedge fund out there saying what I've been saying. So it feels it feels good, not going to lie. But uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, smart people on both sides of the trade. I mean, Ray Dalio and company aren't right 100% of the time. Nobody's right 100% of the time. But I happen to agree with that, with, with what's going on. Because you have to look at it from what also is taking place. And we've had those conversations. And what I'm referring to is the corporate debt load that exists, whether that's in the issuance of corporate bonds, whether that's the commercial and industrial loans that exist, and whether that's the leveraged loans that exist. Now, one of the interesting things here in relation, and I'm going to tie this in with oil, is when you look at a lot of speculative grade and junk grade status on corporate bond issuance, a lot of those companies are in the energy sector because you've got a lot of wildcatters and speculators out there just, you know, they're, they are. They're basically out there with a pan. They're panning for gold, black gold in this case, just trying to strike it rich. And it's a very capital intensive investment. It just, it, it is. I mean, I don't care if you're going for oil, natural gas, both, whether you're fracking, whether you're deep sea drilling, whatever it takes, it's capital intensive. It's a lot of equipment. And the wages to pay these guys is, I mean, it's a good living. Those guys make big money. Okay. But they got a lot of junk. They got a lot of speculative grade debt. So when you have low oil prices, it makes it a lot harder to pay off that debt. But when you have higher oil prices, it makes it easier. Not necessarily easy, but it makes it easier, right? So ironically, when you have these higher oil prices, you can somewhat delay debt default payments and the like. Or maybe you can go and get a better a better rate at a bank or you can, you know, roll over that debt because the bankers are going to say, well, yeah, oil prices is up. We, you know, we have our, our, uh, our banks, you know, we have our analysts here and, and they're saying, you know, oil is likely to stay within a certain range, well above where it was late last year. And uh, yeah, we can, we can, we can negotiate with you because we believe that you're going to be able to make, uh, make these payments because of higher oil prices. So uh, ironically, having a higher oil prices can actually somewhat kick the can down the road as far as when defaults may actually be taking place in regards to some of these energy companies. That's a possibility. I mean, anybody could default anytime. Nobody knows truly what's going on day to day in any of these companies. I mean, you, you just don't. Yeah, you got quarterly filings, but that's a picture in time of one day. You don't know what's happening the next. You don't know what's happening tomorrow, you know. So those are the things that are on my mind right now when it comes to what's going on with these markets because there's, there, we're in a holding pattern. We are in a holding pattern. The other thing I want to discuss here is the total stock market, which has to deal with the Wilshire 5000 full cap price index, okay? So if we look at this graph here, we currently sit at 29,981, all right? Now, this is nearing an all-time high. We had all-time highs back in September of 2018, and these were north of 30,000, 30,400 and change, okay? So technically speaking, I mean, there isn't any reason why the Wilshire 5,000 5, could hit all-time highs within a week. I mean, it could happen. I'm not saying it is going to happen, but it could happen. That's how close we are to hitting those all-time highs again, which is just amazing. Again, that's the, just this V-shaped recovery is just, it's unbelievable because you have to remember it was last year, all the way back in January, where the market had hit a high, 29,500, 29,600. Again, this is on the Wilshire 5,000. You had a sizable drop-off, a correction, so basically a 10% decline. Bounce back up, blah, 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 does a retest, and then it just sort of consolidates for most of the year, and then it hits new highs in the fall. Again, September in this case. Some of them, it depends on what index you were looking at, but it, they made their highs, okay? 
and then we had the 10% decline in the fall, and then we had the 20% decline in the winter. And again, the plunge protection team was sent out by President Trump, Secretary of the Treasury Stephen Mnuchin. They go out there, they meet with the plunge protection team, the largest banks on Wall Street, buy the dips is what the president tweets out, and you have a V-shaped recovery. You want to investigate something? Investigate that. Because he didn't tell you to sell short, he didn't tell you to get out of the market and save 20%, but he told you to buy the dip, and what happened? You got a V-shaped recovery. Very rare that this happens in history, and you have a president that does it, you got a central bank that does a 180 policy on a dime because the babies throw a hissy fit. Investigate that. You, I, I don't care. The, the, you cannot have it. This is not a market. You, just look at the data. I, I mean, I am somewhat at a loss of words sometimes when I look at this stuff and try to explain it because it's just like, are you serious? Come on, man. You, who, who can actually look at this stuff and take this serious and go out there with a straight face and tell the American people that everything's fine? And, you know, and this is what the Federal Reserve and central bankers have to do. That's the right policy, quote unquote. It just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense when you have an understanding of what's going on. And in light of the Federal Reserve, remember, we were talking about the president trying to get a couple of his other men on the board, and that being Stephen Moore and Herman Cain. Well, Herman Cain just withdrew his name from the list. He called up the president this weekend and said, you know, Mr. President, I, you know, it's an honor, blah, 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 but I have to withdraw my, my name from, from being nominated to being uh, a member of the Federal Reserve Board. Of course, he would have had to have been confirmed by the Senate, so that would have been a process, and it could have been a hairy process. We had that conversation last week. But the reason why Herman Cain, and remember, Herman Cain was a 2012 presidential candidate, 999, remember that guy? Uh, he is now concerned, again, because he dropped out of the presidential race because of sexual misconduct allegations, and now those are resurfacing. And now you've also had Gloria Allred, infamous attorney. She loves the limelight, too. And she was basically out there blackmailing is what it was. Herman Cain saying, look, if you do not withdraw your name from nomination, we are going to give specific details of basically your body parts because you did have an affair or this, that, or the other, and we know it. And this is what we're going to do. Well, he backed out. He doesn't want to go through this again, doesn't want to put his wife through this again. And it's understandable. I mean, this is ridiculous. I don't know how that's legal, to be perfectly honest with you. That, is that not blackmail, extortion? Is that not something? Unless you withdraw, we're going to come out and, and, and just ruin your credibility, your reputation in public. I mean, is there no court of law? Does everything have to be done in the court of public opinion? I mean, this is the problem, people. Two-tier justice system public courts. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It's pub public opinion courts is obviously what I mean here. Uh, no, this is such a travesty for this republic because who wants to go out there and serve this country? Who wants to be a public servant, a true public servant? Because if you did something 20, 30 years ago, just clowning around, messing around, they're going to lynch you. They're going to crucify you. They're going to hang you. You could have the best policies. You could be the best man or woman for the job. But God forbid you made a mistake 30 years ago. You're done. You're done. And who wants to be, who wants to put themselves through that? Who wants to put their families through that? I mean, how are we supposed to have a republic? How are we supposed to have a country in any type of economy that is based off of the fundamentals, if we can't put the best policymakers in place, if we can't truly have a free market system in place, how are we supposed to thrive and succeed? Well, we're not. That's the simple answer to the question. You're not. And we're not thriving right now. So that's the shame of it. Now, whether or not Herman Cain was the best man for the job isn't the point of this story. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But this goes to the larger context of how easy it is to destroy somebody's life and reputation. Because it's not just a question of whether or not he actually did have an affair or whether there was sexual misconduct. The allegation alone can destroy somebody. Now, you have, we have somebody in the president, you have Teflon Don, he just doesn't care. 
He's been in the public eye for years. He sought it out. He likes the attention. He knows he's the Manhattan billionaire playboy. Are you surprised? Some of the skeletons in his closet? No, and he doesn't care about it. So that's why it's so hard. You can, you can fling as many arrows as you want at the man, but they don't stick. And he don't care. He may not like it, but ultimately, he don't care. So he can keep moving. Everybody else, people like Herman Cain, maybe Stephen, it doesn't matter what the name is. I mean, this is, you really have to ask your question, what's going to be the state of this country? Because, yeah, right now we have a president. Maybe you like him, maybe you don't. But at least he can take the heat, and a lot of it rolls off. What happens if we have somebody else who can't take the heat, but they have to make crucial decisions? How well are they going to act under this type of pressure? Do they deserve to be put under that type of pressure when they have enough as it is? These are serious questions to ask, by the way. At least they are to me. I hope they are to you. Because this isn't a talk show. This isn't a game show. This isn't a soap opera. As much as it looks like one. As much as it looks and sounds like a three-ring circus, because it is, there's really something truly at stake here. It's our future. It's our economy. And nobody's talking about this stuff. It's impeach the president. It's everything's fine. Buy the dips. Policy reversals on a dime because people are throwing a hissy fit. This is the state of our country. Nobody's talking about any of the crucial issues that is staring us right in the face. And we talk about those here on the Capitol News all the time because we're focused. We have the eye on our, we have our eyes on the ball. It's just a shame that so many of our quote unquote leaders do not. And it's a shame that a lot of good, hardworking people out there have to live paycheck to paycheck and suffer the consequences of this incompetency. You know, I call for a revolution, if you follow me on the geopolitical podcast, with regards to Brexit, if there should be a second referendum vote. Well, you know what? It's going to have to be a little bit closer to home. There's going to have to be a revolution in this country if we can't get off this impeachment process if we can't get off of demonizing people because they made a mistake or did something 30 years ago, if we can't get off this, we're done. And the only solution is going to be a revolution, and we hope that it's a peaceful one. But that's where we are. This is the crossroads of where we are right now as a country. So we can talk all day here, whether it's the political, geopolitical podcast or whether it's the economic podcast, but let's guess what? It ain't going to make a difference. It ain't going to make a difference. If there's no economy to support, to stand up for, because there is no leadership, there is no rule of law, because there's a two-tier justice system, because we can't get together as a country and solve problems, then it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter what judge is being appointed. It doesn't matter who sits on the Federal Reserve, because it's game, set, match. It's over for the United States of America if we cannot pull together to solve these problems. So let's hope and pray we can get over this soap opera crap, because that's what it is. And for the sake of this country and its future, we need to have some leaders lead. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you, as always. We're going to keep this conversation going. Be very mindful of a potential black swan event. You know, the wild card coming out with this Iran deal here with oil and everything, because that's something that could really throw a wrench into this marketplace when we're already on thin ice as it is. So please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, leave your comments. We'd love to hear from you. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Caritis. Godspeed.